My name is Kaylee Vernon Della Russo. I'm the creator of Write or Die Tribe, and I'm currently working on an untitled novel in progress. I know of Kaylee through Write or Die Tribe, which is a very cool online community for writers. You should totally check it out if you are not already familiar. Anyway, I wanted to get to know its founder. She sends out these email blasts and seems to have a very vibrant writing life. And I wanted to learn how she's applying all that to her novel in progress. One of the things I'm trying to be better about is holding it more loosely. Like it's okay for me, even in the stage, to be playing around with scenes that I might never use or, you know, just jotting down notes about a character's backstory that I'll never put in the draft. Like not being so precious about my writing time needs to generate words that are going to be in this draft, you know? I freaking love what Kaylee said about holding it more loosely. That is such a brilliant takeaway. Plus, we end the episode with an all new edition of Prompt Me Daddy. So make sure you stick around to the end to get a lesson from Kaylee. All that and more in today's episode. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Welcome to The Bleeders, a podcast and support group about book writing and publishing. I'm writer and podcaster Courtney Kosak, and each week I'll bring you new conversations with authors, agents, and publishers about how to write and sell books. So before we dive into Kaylee's work in progress, let's get to know today's guest a little bit better. So when did you first identify as a writer? So I have always wanted to be a writer since I was a kid. I really can't say that I've had any other dream. <laughs> um, but I feel like I haven't really started identifying as a writer until more recently. I think, you know, I'm not alone in like subscribing to the idea that you're not a writer until you have something published. And I really felt that way for so long. And I think it wasn't until I started really taking my writing seriously and like establishing a routine mm -hmm. that I was like, I'm doing this every day. Like I'm calling myself what I am. So yeah. Yeah. The practice definitely helps. What's your all time favorite book? Um, you know, this is like the hardest question ever, but I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the one that I have read the most and have come back to the most is actually The Virgin Suicides by oh. Jeffrey Eugenides. It's just like, so I get really lost in the language. It's very whimsical to me. It's funny and tragic, which are always my two favorite, um, <laughs> two favorite genres, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think that that would be my favorite. I've only seen the movie. I haven't read the book. Is it like very similar? It is. And I love the movie so much. Like I'm I'm just a, as much a fan of the movie as the book. I mean, Kirsten oh, Dunst, right? <laughs> that's rare with a favorite book. Yeah. What is your dream writing routine? I'm definitely a morning writer. So, you know, I think it would just be wake up in some secluded, like in the woods, or maybe, maybe now where the book I'm writing, it takes place near a beach. So maybe I'd want to be near a beach and wake up, do some writing. I really get a lot of inspiration from listening to music. So I think it would involve taking a walk, listening to music, come back, do some more writing and then just like read for the rest of the day. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I like those vibes. What's your real writing routine? So I still get up in the, I still write in the morning. I wish I could say I was one of those like 5 a.m. writers. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. I try to get up at six. Most of the time can't do it. <laughs> um, but if I don't, like I start my day job, which I work from home, which I'm really lucky. Um, so I don't have to be anywhere right away really, but I still have to have some kind of structure. So I try to write from like seven to eight. Sometimes it doesn't last that long, but, um, and then, you know, breakfast, coffee into work. Do you hold yourself to any sort of like word count standards or anything like that? Or are you just like, I have to touch it every day? I really have to touch it every day. I'm finding that out about myself through I'm writing a novel right now. If I go too many days without it, I just feel so disconnected from it. So yeah, I definitely have to touch it every day, but I love a word count. Like if I'm in the stage of the writing where I just need to generate words, I'm like a thousand words a day type uh -huh. of person. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll talk about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's one piece of writing that makes you jealous you didn't write it? So I have two 
two thoughts on that. I just finished The Blurry Years by Eleanor Kreisman. It came out, I think, in 2018, and I'm like obsessed with it. Like, I got it from the library, read it, immediately bought it. I just keep opening up and reading random pages. So I think that one is up there. Um, Wait, what is it about? Oh, it's about this um, a girl aged like five to 18 throughout the course of the story. And it's her and her single alcoholic mother and her mother just sort of takes her, takes her all over, just like not really watching her and their relationship. But the way that she writes is sort of in these little chunks Oh. that just flow so nicely together. Like I just, I love how she did it. Amazing. Okay. And number two? Uh, number two is definitely Heartbroke by Chelsea Beaker. Have you read that? No. Oh my God. I'm like Chelsea Beaker's biggest fan, number one. I read <laughs> Godshot from her and I just read everything she writes, but her short story collection is just so good. Like she's amazing at She's amazing at writing a novel, but the short story form, I feel like, is just her jam because she creates these really amazing, like, quirky but, like, sad characters, and it's just so good. It's one of those that I can just pick up and read any day. <laughs> oh, I just got, like, three wrecks off you. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so... I invited you here to talk about your work in progress. And I saw on an email that you sent out recently that a writing partnership kind of like came out of you doing NaNoWriMo. And I was very curious, like, if that's how your novel writing started. And I want to hear about this writing partnership. Okay, cool. Yes. So in NaNoWriMo 2020, that's when I started this novel. I had had the idea for probably years and it just you know, I didn't know where to start. It felt so big. I questioned if I could do it. And I just got interested in NaNoWriMo. And then with the community around Ride or Die mm -hmm. Tribe, people were talking about it. So I was like, okay, let's, let's try this out. So I ended up creating a writing group with probably like eight or 10 other writers. And we would meet every other week during NaNoWriMo and just talk about writing the novel. And through that group, I met Tamar, who lives in California. So I'm on the East Coast. She's in California. Uh -huh. um, and we just kind of started talking outside the group. And then we started texting every day like, okay, I wrote my whatever 1,500 words today. I didn't write my 1,500 words. It's a terrible day. Like that sort of thing. We just sort of were holding each other accountable. And I didn't realize how much I needed that. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone knows how solitary writing is, but having a writing partner, like I probably wouldn't have anywhere near a novel without her. Like I say that to her all the time, which she disagrees, but I really believe it because just having someone that I can talk to every day about those little things is so, it's just like so valuable. And so it's two years later, we still talk every day and we're still writing the novels together. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Okay, I need one of those. <laughs> um, is it your first novel? Yes, first novel, first time attempting a novel. So what was your experience before that? Yeah, so I had written short fiction, and then I went through a phase of writing personal essays, which actually we have a Chloe Caldwell connection to. Oh, yeah. I took a class from her probably like four or five years ago, and um, she was awesome. But also reading her work, one of the things that inspired me is that she didn't get an MFA, uh -huh. and she is amazing and super successful, and I don't have an MFA. So I was like, if Chloe can do it, <laughs> maybe I can. <laughs> yeah, totally. So yeah, she she's great. So it was really just short fiction and short like personal essays before, and I had this novel idea like I said, for a while. And I got that book, um, The 98 Day Novel by Alan Watt. I don't know if you've heard of it. I think that's on my list. I'm collecting books like that right now. <laughs> yeah. So it's really good. I recommend it to everyone. Like I know it sounds kind of like gimmicky, but the way he structures it is he kind of sets you up with really thought-provoking questions before you even start writing. So I was kind of doing those and getting some sense of, okay, Maybe this is a story. Maybe I can do this. And then NaNoWriMo started. Beautiful. Okay. So I guess we sort of buried the lead here. What is the premise <laughs> of your novel in progress? <laughs> so it is a story about a 19, 20-year-old girl named Rita. She has sort of 
been like taking care of her family this whole time and sort of putting her life on hold. Um, her mom is this very eccentric, but very Catholic woman who just can't get out of her own way. Like she can't hold down a job and her father has just died. So it prompts them to have to move to the, her uncle's sort of broken down cottage in this New England town. And she's just ready to like start her life, detach from family, move on. So she starts working as a waitress at a country club. So that was really the premise of where it started. So she starts working at the club and the whole restaurant dynamic happens. They're partying, they're drinking, they're sleeping with each other. She's sort of enmeshed in this world, pulling away from her mom and her Catholicism. And then she just kind of starts realizing that there's all these unspoken rules and expectations being in such a male-dominated space as a country club. And yeah, so it's kind of what happens when her obsession with like money and attention gets too big, gets too much. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Can you tell I haven't finished it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to like leave some suspense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Compare it to something. What are your comps when you're thinking about it? I'm thinking of it as like Stephanie Danler's Sweet Bitter meets Lana Del Rey's Born to Die album. I was totally going to say Sweet Bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Which I loved. So tell me where you're at in the process right now and how many drafts you've done and what's working and what's not. So yeah, after I did NaNoWriMo, I spent the rest of the year, I think probably by like January, February of the new year, I finished a draft, which was very much a discovery draft. It was just me sort of blurting out every thought that I had about the story, every scene. And it really didn't have much of a plot, to be honest. It was just, let's see what I have here. Mm -hmm. So I didn't take too much of a break from it. I was just really still enthusiastic about it. So I kept going and I did something that I am going to say to other writers don't do is I got stuck in act one for months. I rewrote mm -hmm. act one, like the first 50, 60 pages probably like 10 times because I felt the way it felt to me was like, I need to get the beginning right quote mm -hmm. <laughs> um, before I can move on. And I ended up getting really frustrated and discouraged and thinking like, this has fallen apart. Like I can't do this. And I feel like it's so obvious now that that's not the way I should have approached it, but it was just how I it's just how I was working. I felt like I needed to know so much of the beginning before. So I've since switched to that. And now I'm in, I guess, my second draft, technically, from the whole thing. And I've been moving forward, which I'm so glad I have because I'm obviously learning more about the characters. I'm discovering the plot and the story. And I know I'm going back to Act One and rewriting that, but um, I'm learning so much by just moving forward. So if anyone can take any advice from me, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you wrote it 10 times. Like, were they vastly different? And did you, I mean, it is kind of a little bit world building. Like, did you mm -hmm. gain anything from that? I definitely did. Like, I'm very hard on myself and I'm just like, oh, I wasted all this time. But I know that I've developed the character so much more. And like you said, world building. And yes, things definitely did change. Uh, for the better. So it's it's definitely not wasted. How are you thinking about moving forward? Like what's your game plan? And at what point do you think you'll be ready to start querying? So I really want to just finish the draft that I'm in now and just have like a solid draft that has a beginning, middle, and an end that right. I feel comfortable <laughs> with. Like I just want to have all the the stuff so I can start really molding it. Um, so I, I'm not really sure about querying yet, but I'm really excited to just have more to work with mm -hmm. um, and start really just start another draft. Nice. What would you say is your biggest challenge at the moment? Um, at the moment, I think for me, it's just getting through that sort of murky middle where I sort of know where I'm going with the ends, but there's all the space in between. And I think too, one of the things I'm trying to be better about is holding it more loosely. Like it's okay for me, even in this stage, to be playing around with scenes that I might never use or, you know, just 
jotting down notes about a character's backstory that I'll never put in the draft, like not being so precious about my writing time needs to generate words that are going to be in this draft, you know? And it's definitely going better on the days that I have that mindset where I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to play today and just mm -hmm. see see what happens. Like try this random prompt or just write out a conversation that goes nowhere, you know? So I think that that's been a challenge for me, but I'm getting better at it. Ah, <laughs> oh, holding it loosely. Oh, I love that. That is like the hardest thing, I think, being like, oh, I'm going to invest this time into making some, it is making it better, but it's not in a tangible way that you can like count or see, which exactly. is so hard. Yeah. I know. And I think too, always thinking about the product is, is hard because of course you're putting all this time and effort and I see the story so clearly in my head and I want to share it. Like it just thinking about the product is really not beneficial to me because this could take me a couple more years. Like I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure I've never done this before, so right. I'm still learning. So yeah, that's what I think of too. When I hold it loosely is like, this can just be for you right now because you are excited about the story and you want to write the story. Yes. We talked a little bit about daily practice and stuff. What have you learned about like yourself as a writer and your process and what you need? I've definitely learned that I need thinking time. <laughs> like even if I set my day up where I end my writing time and I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to tackle this scene. I need to think about that scene a lot. I've uh -huh. noticed before I really start writing, like I'm definitely a writer that will start writing and I need to like get up and pace the house and then come back. Or um, something that helps me a lot is if I even if I need to run an errand or just dro like drive in my car with music on all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that scene makes sense. And I want to like drive back home quickly. Right. <laughs> so it's like, I, yes. I need like space to think as much as I need time to write it. That's awesome. So I ask everybody, what's your all time favorite piece of your own writing? So I just finished a short story that I have sent out to a number of places, fingers crossed. And it actually does take place in a country club like my novel. I just uh -oh. really wanted to like tackle the same kind of environment in a smaller form. And it was just a really fun piece to write. I genuinely had so much fun and I've read it a million times and I still want to keep reading it. So it was just kind of a confidence boost for me, I feel like, of like, okay, you can do this novel because you at least wrote, <laughs> wrote this, you know? So I think that's my favorite. I love that. Is there anything else that you want to share about your work in progress? I have to say I got the idea because I do work in a country club and I have on and off for about eight years. And it's a really weird world, man. Like <laughs> it's a really weird world. So I that's where the idea came from. And that's why I want to keep writing about it. And I wrote the short story too. I just feel like there's endless stories. And also, I'm kind of like not seeing a ton about the service industry. And I mm -hmm. love I love talking to people who are in the service industry and who know that world. And yeah, so I'm just hoping that this will, you know, my novel will be part of that kind of category of literature. Yeah, I just actually watched Sweet Bitter, the TV show. Let's put some vibes out that your future novel will be optioned. <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> Okay. So you interview some writers yourself. What are some of the favorite things that you've learned from interviewing other writers? Yeah. I think one of my favorite things about interviewing them in general is just, of course, talking about writing. Like whenever I can find anyone you know that you want to talk about right. writing to, it's just so fun. And also it's just everyone I've interviewed is so enthusiastic about other people's writing. Like if I just say, oh, I'm a writer too. They're like, really? What are you writing? And it's like, just that community is so awesome. Mm -hmm. I just, I love interviewing. But um, something that stands out is um, I got to interview Melissa Phoebos, who <sighs> I was like, I was so excited about that interview because it was a phone one too. Like it wasn't through email or anything. <laughs> And she was great. We had an awesome conversation, but I had asked her, you know, for any aspiring writing advice and her advice really um, spoke to me. And she was like, take your time, mm -hmm. go slow. 
it's not like you're running to a finish line. You know, like writing takes time, developing your voice takes time, developing your writing style takes time. Like just go slow and like find out what kind of writer you are. And after what I was just saying about <laughs> being in act one for months, like I just love that. And I want to just constantly remind myself that it's not a race, you know? Oh, yes. Carmen Maria Machado wrote this thing in her sub stack. I put it in the last Bleeders newsletter, I think. But she had this thing exactly about that, about like, yeah, if I would have rushed and like published the book that I finished in my MFA, like that would have been a book, but maybe not as good of a book, you know, mm -hmm. and like really just drilled into that whole idea. And I was, and left me with this, that like, you only get to debut once and not that that like has to be everything. And like, obviously you can go on and write other stuff, but like, just like the take your time of it and like, let it be the thing that it's supposed to be. You know, you get so excited about the prospect of publishing that sometimes that gets lost. And I think it's so important. I'm trying to ground myself in that too. Yeah, especially when you're seeing people on like social media and stuff, what they're doing, what they're publishing, because right. of course, you're not there with them in all the time it took to write. You're just there to get the announcement. So I think that, that that's a great thing to remember for that too, because it's kind of always in your face and you're like, everyone's doing things and right. I'm not, but you don't right. know about all that time in between. Totally. Okay. So how did Write or Die Tribe start? Tell listeners about that. And Okay the community and how they can get involved. So Ride or Die Tribe started for me, I think out of loneliness. <laughs> <laughs> I had fin you know, I finished college and my little writing network was gone. Everyone went their separate ways and it was just me. And I had been interested in in blogging before and just having a website. So it sort of came from that of like, okay, need some writers in my life. Let's let's see what's out there. And mm -hmm. um yeah, so it's been five years now, which is wild. Um, but yeah, so we're a community that provides resources, inspiration, and connection. We have, you know, open submission lists on there. We hold wor um, workshops. We have writing prompts. We have weekly blog posts geared towards helping writers and, you know, inspiring you, giving you resources. We also have a community membership, which is really fun. Um, it's a forum away from social media, so it's just on the website. So you can connect with other writers. You can you can find a writing partner. You can find a reader. And we just try to do different prompts to start conversation. And then we just started a hit submit party. Every month we come together at, on Zoom and we just talk about like where we're submitting, where we want to submit, what we're submitting, the projections, the acceptances, and just very casual. And we try to make it like a party. So it's fun. I love that. Yeah. So Shelby uh, Hinty, who is on the podcast, is currently teaching through you. And I think I took a one-off class from you in your 30-day writer challenge, but I totally encourage people to get involved. It's a really cool community. Thank you. I know. And I love Shelby. Shelby is like she got involved in the community right away. So I've just known her for this long and she's just awesome. She pitches the best interviews. She's great. I was so excited to listen to her episode where you yeah. talked because I can't wait for her novel. I know, seriously. Um, okay, so we'll do your prompt. But before that, just let everybody know how they can connect with you online and stay in touch. Yeah, so I'm basically on Ride or Die Tribe. So you can find Ride or Die Tribe on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, all just at Ride or Die Tribe. We do a Monday resource newsletter, which I it's free and we kind of put like everything in it every Monday. So I would recommend signing up for that. Definitely. Okay. So prompt us, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I chose this prompt from, it's from Matt Bell's Substack. He, do you subscribe? He has yes. these awesome prompts every month. And the reason why I chose it is because it helped me write the short story I mentioned that has daddy in the title. Ooh. So I thought it would go well. <laughs> well done. Um, <laughs> all right. So I just sort of condensed his very long prompt, um, just sort of the highlights of what helped me. So write a scene depicting a single activity 
from beginning to end. So this could be cooking a meal, knitting a sweater, or in the case of my story, it's one character slapping another character across the face. So one action. (laughs) So don't start the scene with thought or feeling. Write the thoughts and feelings that emerge from the action. So as interiority creeps in, attach it to the physical action that produced it or the one that follows. So if every physical action begins with like a want or desire, the steps of your chosen action will carry that want and desire forward as long as you don't forget about the action. So for this exercise, he says, try not to have a sentence that contains only thought and emotion, but have the action there too. So he says too, to think about how you can manipulate the time of the story because like something like slapping someone across the face is a second, but in prose, you can really slow it down Mm -hmm. and break it down. So it's just a really fun prompt to take an action that you can describe in a sentence or two and just break it down and like see what else is layered in there. Can you share your example? Yeah. So one of the things he talks about in that prompt too is taking away in action in the sequence. So I didn't actually say that she slapped. Like I never actually said anything about the slap. It was just sort of like her head turned, the thing she noticed in the room as like time kind of slowed down. And it just, it's a pivotal moment in the story. So it felt right to have the action be expressed that way. I love it. Well, thank you. Um, This was awesome. It was really cool getting to know you. And yeah, I hope you're back on talking about your novel whenever it's ready. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. This was awesome. Thanks again to Kaylee. And that is it for this edition of The Bleeders. You've all been officially prompted by today's daddy, Kaylee Brennan Della Russo. And if you're not signed up for Matt Bell's Substack, you better get on that. You just might hear him pop up on this podcast in the very near future. I also highly recommend checking out writeordietribe.com for more about how to get involved with that community and maybe take some classes. Who knows? Maybe I'll see you over there. And if you missed the last episode with Bassi Ikby about her writing and publishing process for literally one of my favorite books, I'm Telling the Truth But I'm Lying, make sure to go back and check it out. Seriously, it's so, so good. Here is a little preview of that conversation. And another reason why I didn't think I could ever write a book is because I don't have a good memory. And I know that's funny to say because I have such distinct memories, but I have an emotional memory. I remember you do. I remember how things felt. And because I can remember how they felt, I can retrace what happened, but it's always still from my perspective. We tend to put so much emphasis on chronological memory. Somehow, if I say that it hurt when I fell and you know, skinned my knee in the fourth grade and somebody said, oh, well, it was actually the sixth grade. Does it make my knee hurt any less? Does, mm, does right. it make the memory, the feeling, the fear, the, the pain, the whatever I felt, does that make it any less important that I felt it or is it more important that I got the date right? Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Bleeders. Oh, writing is so much better with friends. I'm your host, Courtney Kosak, and hey, let's connect on social media. I am at Courtney Kosak, K-O-C-A-K, on Twitter and Instagram. And make sure you're signed up for the Bleeders Companion Substack. The link is in the episode description. And join me again in two weeks for another episode. In the meantime, happy bleeding! Bleeding!